the best there is, the best there was, the best there ever will be. We won't have another Brett Hitman heart. That's just a fact. The mold is broken. The legacy is indelible. He will forever be remembered as, without question, one of the greatest professional wrestlers that professional wrestling ever produced. But there was this one year, right? So I bet you thought that CM Punk returning to WWE was unthinkable, right? I mean, sure, WWE fired Punk on his wedding day, but they never willingly and knowingly deceived him mid-match in his home country. Nah, nah, Bret Hart's WWE return was truly, truly the stuff of wild message board fantasy booking. You can't bury the hatchet if that hatchet is still stuck in the guy's back. So when the new decade began with Bret the Hitman heart standing in a WWE ring. It wasn't so much hell freezing over, it was a, a netherworld ice age. And we're going to break down Bret Hart's WWE return in 2010, one that saw the Hitman back in the loop on WWE TV, and how this inconceivable comeback went down week by week, and in a lot of cases, week by week, spelled E-A-K. How did we get here though? What led to a thawing so intense that it could have left Canada underwater. We need to go back to Montreal in 1997. Now, don't worry, we're not gonna we're not gonna dwell on the screw job business. We have a fantastic documentary on the Cultaholic channel that gives you every single beat of that particular drum. Now, let us start the night after. Vince McMahon, black-eyed and belligerent, declaring to the world that Brett screwed Brett. And Vince McMahon's decision to change the ending to his match with Shawn Michaels without telling Brett at all was all the hitman's faults for refusing to drop the WWF title in Montreal. It forced Vince's hand, according to Vince, to do something that hadn't really been done since the early Wild West days of wrestling. Brett screwed Brett, said Vince, and Vince, Vince believed it too, so it seemed. Now this move led Brett into the arms of Ted Turner, and soon enough, he was part of World Championship Wrestling, bolstering their war chest in the ongoing Monday Night War. 12 months in, it became apparent that Eric Bischoff and co had no idea what to do with a Bret Hart. It felt like that he'd been purchased out of spite rather than because they were flush with creative concepts for Canada's hero. It would be in a WCW ring that Bret Hart's wrestling career would come to a very sudden end. A stray kick from Bill Goldberg at Starcade 1999 caused Bret to suffer a concussion. Left un treated, it caused Brett to, to have post-concussion syndrome, something numbed by a handful of painkillers every couple of hours. When finally diagnosed, Hart stepped back from wrestling completely. WCW, in a financial crisis by this point, terminated his contract due to inactivity. Now, they were sympathetic to his condition, as post-concussion syndrome leaves you unable to travel, so they FedExed him his termination letter. It was a rotten end to what had been a pretty rotten run as part of WCW. Not the way the wrestling world deserved to remember one of the all-time greats, and certainly not the way that an all-time great should bow out. During his ill-fated WCW tenure, there'd actually been a meeting between Bret Hart and Vince McMahon. Bret describes meeting his old boss on a park bench in Calgary to catch up just before Owen Hart's funeral. Now, this was meant to be a meeting near a bridge, but the location was changed at the request of Vince, who feared that Bret may throw him over. Uh, safely on a seat in a very public setting, Vince met with Bret, and Bret said he wanted photos and videos from his WWF run, and Vince agreed, saying, that he could have whatever he wanted. When Brett called the office of Vince McMahon a few days later to make arrangements, he was informed that Vince McMahon had no recollection of this conversation ever happening. Bret Hart officially retired as a competitor at the end of 2000. He felt so confident in doing so because he, like several others wrestling in the 80s, had taken out insurance with Lloyds of London that would pay out should he be unable to wrestle. Now, for some of the guys, this ended up being a nice little earner. But Lloyds would soon cotton on to the fact that a wrestling retirement wasn't like 
every other retirement. And they started withholding funds. This is exactly what happened to Brett when he claimed permanent disability. Lloyds weren't going to get stung again, and they chose for a long time not to pony up. This led to a long-winded lawsuit, and in November of 2005, I told you it was long-winded, Bret Hart was awarded $800,000 in damages from Lloyds of London. During this legal battle, Bret faced some incredibly tough times. A messy divorce, the passing of his mom and his dad, and his brother-in-law, the British Bulldog, they all hit him really hard. In 2002, a bike accident left Bret Hart suffering a stroke, and for a while, unable to walk. It's weird to think that with all of that going on, Lloyds of London was still like, yeah, we're not convinced the aren't going to start taking bumps next weekend. Between frustrating phone calls with Lloyds, there was a call, unbelievably, from Vince McMahon. He touched base with Brett while he was in hospital, assuring him that the hitman's legacy would not be forgotten. Vince is doing this despite all that's gone on between them. Anybody else, you'd assume some sort of Ebenezer Scrooge-esque changing of the ways. But I'm never quite buying that Vince is anything other than a Jacob Marley. Brett would make a remarkable recovery from his stroke and would even dip his toe back into the wrestling waters. He joined World Wrestling All-Stars, an ill-fated international wrestling promotion built from the wreckage of Monday Night Wars. Brett was sometimes commissioner, sometimes just a special guest, but the role was pretty similar either way. He'd cut a promo about the old days, he'd talk about the adversity that he'd faced, he'd talk about America beating the terrorists, and if time allowed, he'd book a match and pop a sharpshooter on Jeff Jarrett. Jerry Lawler also told a story on his podcast about how he and Bret Hart rapped on a WWA show and then just popped along to a local brothel. <laughs> <laughs> like, like you do. Brett was kept in the public sphere all the while via his column in the Calgary Sun. He'd wax lyrical about the world and would often use it as a very public way to air grievances with his nearest and dearest. In one scathing column after the passing of his mother, Brett described Diana Hart Smith's tell-all biography about uh, the family heart as, quote, a gossip and scandal book. He also chastised Diana, Ellie and Bruce Hart for orchestrating a PR moment where they planned to meet up with Vince McMahon, a move that Brett believes was to secure future employment in the WWF for various family members. He also revealed in the Calgary Sun that he batted away an olive branch extended to him by the WWF in 2002. He was invited via a mediary to attend WrestleMania X8, emanating from the Toronto Sky Dome, in return for those much sought after photos and videos that he'd requested all those years prior. You know, the ones that Vince had forgotten he'd requested? Still burned from that rather disrespectful meeting and probably slightly regretting not having a meeting near a bridge after all, Brett said no to the invite to Mania. He declared an epiphany that he had in his column, saying, my legacy is the reputation I've built, not a bunch of videotapes and pictures. Despite all that had gone on between them, Vince McMahon did not let up in inviting the hitman back to the dance. He struck up a likeness deal, did Brett with THQ to feature in new WWE video games, and he even got the call from Vince's office to record interviews for a documentary called Screwed, the Bret Hart story. This was apparently going to be a special presentation all about that thing in Montreal that time. How was it being spun by WWE? Well, apparently one of the talking heads in the early version calls Brett unprofessional, so that should give you an idea of where they were going with that one. Now, the word also got out that WWE we were working on a DVD called The Self-Destruction of the Ultimate Warrior, an absolute burial of Jim Helwig. Brett only agreed to do the interviews for this doc if it was a celebration of his career rather than a hatchet job. So the company pivoted, renaming it Brett Hart. The best there is, the best there was, the best there ever will be. That's better. Brett would later say and even claim that the screwed pitch was a ruse, a kind of sword of Damocles approach with WWE, threatening to tear Brett apart if he doesn't join in the fun. 
two years later, Bret Hart took his rightful place in the WWE Hall of Fame. But it's a memory he would rather soon forget. Still recovering from the lingering effects of post-concussion syndrome and that near fatal stroke, Bret didn't feel ready to start publicly speaking again, let alone on a show run by Vince McMahon about Vince McMahon and the WWE. Bret also turned down the offer to appear the following night at WrestleMania itself to do that bit where all the new Hall of Fame inductees stand on the stage and wave like kinetic action figures. <laughs> Behind the scenes, Vince was desperately trying to get Bret more and more involved. See, Vince at the time was in a feud with Shawn Michaels and he hoped that the hitman playing some sort of special role would be the icing on the cake. Bret turned down any and all offers to get into the mix of this particular story and instead of getting Bret Hart to be Shawn's tag partner in a match against Vince McMahon and Shane McMahon, they booked God instead. A year prior, Bret was approached also by Kurt Angle for a showdown at WrestleMania 21. WWE, of course they were up for it, but Bret wasn't. Another idea revealed by Court Bauer on Talk is Jericho would have seen Team Bret versus Team McMahon. Bret Hart in the corner of Chris Jericho, Davey Boy Smith Jr., Tyson Kidd, Teddy Hart and Natalia facing a team led by Vince McMahon consisting of Shawn Michaels, Paul London, Brian Kendrick and Brian Danielson. How close we were to seeing the American Dragon and the Hitman in the same act atmosphere in the mid noughties Oh, one we could salivate on such a thing. Court Bauer was in the room when Vince called Brett to pitch this idea, and Brett said yes before changing his mind about two days later. Ah, we're back to the back to the drawing board. At this point, Vince is very much like a keen fisherman. He knows that the likeness deal and the Hall of Fame induction has got a bite out of this Bret Hart-shaped carp. You have to wonder whether Vince is doing this because there's money to be made because he wants closure for himself and Bret Hart, or because he's a bit of an egomaniac and he wants to say he got the man who hates him the most to work for him again. Maybe it's a little bit of all three. So what finally led to Vince reeling in the catch of a lifetime? Bret Hart instigated this surprisingly. He and Vince spoke in February of 2009, Hart claiming that he was getting pretty bored in retirement. He'd written books, done a bit of acting, he even starred in a 2004 stage production of Aladdin, filling the Arabian Nights with the sounds of joints popping in the sharpshooter. But he was still bored and wanted to get back into the wrestling game again. He was also toying with going back to school at this point at the American Film Institute, but the stock market crash meant that he had to be a little bit more careful with money. And a third home in LA, on top of his homes in Calgary and Kona, Hawaii, wasn't really in the budget. Is this another reason maybe why Brett felt like now was the time to pick up the phone and get a job? Maybe. Brett and Vince spoke throughout 2009, ironing out ideas for how to bring the hitman back. One thing for sure was it would be done in conjunction with an all new Hart Family DVD coming out in 2010, which in turn was coinciding with Stu Hart being inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame, an oversight that was finally being seen to. The stars all aligned. Brett Hart would return turn to seek vengeance on Vince McMahon and in doing so use the WWE machine to truly celebrate the Hart family. All of this was happening at the same time as a major move was being made by a rival wrestling promotion, probably the biggest since the Monday Night Wars of the 90s. TNA Wrestling bolstered with Dixie Carter's family's money and Hulk Hogan's 24 inch pythons were making a play for WWE's home turf. TNA Impact was moving to Monday nights in direct competition with Monday Night Raw starting in January. It was a ballsy move, that's for sure. One that Hogan Carter and Eric Bischoff felt would pay off if they promised Hulk Hogan stepping back into the ring on January the 4th. I mean, what could WWE possibly do to top that? We found out as 2009 came to a close, after some cajoling from Shawn Michaels, Vince McMahon revealed that the January 4th episode of Raw would be guest hosted by Brett Hitman Hart. This came to a thunderous ovation. The unthinkable had been thought. 
Behind the scenes, Bret had indeed signed with WWE. It was a short-term contract that would see Bret Hart as part of WWE programming up to and including WrestleMania 26, with an option, if he enjoyed himself, to stick around a little longer. All the talk is over. It is January the 4th, the first WWE Raw of 2010. Backstage, as the clock draws closer to showtime, Bret Hart actually meets up with Shawn Michaels in the dressing room beforehand. Two blokes who just wanted to bury the hatchet and move on. The Wrestling Observer says Shawn was very apologetic backstage. His tone would shift somewhat when the cameras were on, but Dave Meltzer gives a reason for this, saying, quote, in storyline, they felt it was important to portray this as a situation where there was a disagreement and neither side feels they were wrong, but are working past it because it was a disagreement from so many years in the past. But Sean was keen to apologize emphatically before the cameras went on. The Raw backstage area is far busier tonight than it's been in a while. Everybody wants to see Bret Hart, some coming from SmackDown to take in the Atmos, despite not officially being booked for the show tonight. The handshakes, the hugs, and the high fives have to stop for now, though, as Raw is going on the air. The first thing we see on the show is a video package showcasing Bret Hart's greatest moments. We even get that little kid from the new generation era shouting Bret! You know the one, bless him, he's probably in his 50s now. The video doesn't sugarcoat the past either. We get an extensive look at the Montreal screw job and Sean's challenge to Vince from last week to bring the hitman back. Justin Roberts announces it and then the the unthinkable, the unreal happens. Brett, the hitman heart, walks onto the stage on Monday Night Raw. Hands in pockets and jean shorts freshly pressed. One issue here, right? We we get this sort of wacky rock led remix of Bret Hart's theme song when really, we should have just got a classic theme at this point. Now you'd be forgiven for thinking that it was Natalia popping out instead. Why mess with Brett's original theme? There's a sea of adoring Bret Hart signs regardless, but my eyes are drawn as if by an eye magnet to the sign that says Brett screwed Brett and Brett who, which you would have believe in modern day WWE would have been confiscated for, for daring to say such a thing on a big night like this. Brett acknowledges that hell has frozen over and says it's an amazing feeling to be back in WWE. He says he's tried to come back multiple times, but Vince McMahon always shot it down. But he's here now and he's grateful to speak to the WWE Universe, now all chanting welcome back. He recalls being at the Nutter Center to win King of the Ring, even throws a nod to Jerry Lawler, who famously attacked him after winning that tournament. Here's the meat and potatoes of this promo though. Brett calls out Shawn Michaels. The two go face to face in a ring for the first time since that fateful night in 1997. Brett says he wants to bury the hatchet and call a truce, which gets a mixed reaction. Shawn says there's something he's waited 12 years to say. You deserved what happened in Montreal. You disrespected me and this business, and I did have a hand in what Vince McMahon did that night. Wowzers! Big you screwed Brett chance ringing out. Sean says there's a part of me that doesn't regret a bit of it. Clearly relishing being a baddie once again. He then says, but there's another part of me that knows that in the last 12 years, a lot of things have changed. I always respected you, just never felt that you respected me. There were times I couldn't stand the sight of you, and I know the feeling is more than mutual. When I think of Bret Hart, I don't think of Montreal. I think of Anaheim, California, and a 60-minute Ironman match that everybody said nobody wanted to see, yet we went out there and did it. Sean, having got that off his chest, says he wants to bury the hatchet and move on. Brett says their careers shouldn't be tagged by what happened at Survivor Series. And it's as good a time here and now to look each other in the eye and say we can be friends. Brett extends a hand 
and the crowd aren't too sure about it. Sean thinks about it for about 300 years before accepting it to a huge ovation. Sean goes to leave, but as he does, kind of lines up for a super kick, <laughs> but instead turns around and hugs Brett. Even sweeter chin music, you might say. A wholesome wrestling moment, one of many that we'll speak about in 2010. Now, we can never mention Survivor Series 1997 ever again. Brett hasn't left the ring because he has another issue to deal with. So he calls out Vince McMahon. Nothing happens for a very long time. So we throw to a match graphic for Randy Orton versus Kofi Kingston. So I guess Vince isn't coming out. Okay, I guess we're going to pop a pin in that for now. Bit weird way to end the segment, but yeah, sure, whatever. After the break, Vince McMahon speaks to Josh Matthews, claiming he was in a meeting. Didn't hear Brett call him out. Vince says he'll call Brett out later if the Hitman fancies a public discussion. Raw rolls on. Brett has a lovely little backstage area just for him. It's got pink curtains and photos of Brett everywhere. Oh, he loved it. A writer is chatting to Brett before getting shooed away and there's a little knock at the door. And here's Chris Jericho popping by, reminiscing with Brett about perfecting the walls of Jericho on Keith Hart back in the dungeon days. Poor Keith. He's tapped so hard the cats ran off. Jer Jericho offers a suggestion for Brett to really get his own back on Sean by Brett being the guest referee for Chris Jericho and the Big Show's tag team title shot against DX. Chris encourages Jericho to let instinct take over when he sees fit and screw Shawn Michaels over in the same way that Shawn screwed him. Brett turns the idea down, saying he wants peace in the valley now, but Jericho ain't buying it. He calls him a hypocrite. He's been doing that a lot lately. It was like a 2010 little bit of the bubbly. He says it was actually him that was screaming the dungeon down, scaring the cats away, not Keith. Ha <laughs> ha, showed you. Another weird segment with Bret Hart, sure, whatever. Randy Orton catches up with Vince McMahon later on. He offers his services as the legend killer to deal with Bret Hart in return for the number 30 spot in the Rumble. Vince declines and returns to his office. The final segment of Raw sees Vince heading to the ring. True to his word, he calls out Bret Hitman Hart. He thanks Bret for being the guest host and starts to big up Iron Mike Tyson as next week's guest host. Maybe we bury the hatchet with him and, I don't know, Lennox Lewis. He has no intention on addressing Bret Hart, so Bret just saunters out. No music and no fanfare. He gets up in Vince's face. Vince, aware that a crowd in Dayton want to see him apply the sharpshooter. Before he does, though, Vince reiterates that Bret did indeed screw Bret. He'll never forget getting spat on and sucker punched by Bret after the screw job and the disrespect he gave Vince at the Hall of fame he'll never forget that either vince is hopeful that brett is ready to apologize which gets the kind of reaction you would expect brett takes the microphone and says he is convinced he and vince want the same thing closure McMahon agrees and recalls Brett's first WrestleMania, saying he knew Brett was the future when he saw him compete in the Battle Royal at Mania 2. That's the one with Refrigerator Perry, in it? That's it. He commends Brett for scratching and clawing his way to the top. And then Vince reveals that Stu Hart has been nominated for the WWE Hall of Fame. He thanks Brett for all the thrilling moments he gave the universe and being the best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be. Vince reaches out a hand and Brett shakes it. Vince raises Brett's hand and they pose for the crowd. And then whoop -a! Vince cracks Brett right in the clackers. Didn't see that coming, did we? Oh. On a night where Brett wanted Survivor Series closure, the show ends with the Hitman being once more unexpectedly emasculated by Vince McMahon. This was an episode of Raw like no other. The Brett and Sean meeting felt surreal from start to finish. I mean, they'd had that documentary where they sat down and aired their grievances, but this was something else. The Brett and Vince segment had a different energy as well for very obvious reasons. Now, the original machinations for this McMahon moment of malcontent was to have Vinnie Max slap Brett across the face. This was binned off due to Brett's very real concerns as a man recovering from a career-ending concussion. 
The storyline between Vince McMahon and Bret Hart, according to Bret in an interview with the Wrestling Observer, had been very meticulously mapped out for numerous reasons from beginning to end. Bret had veto powers, so if there was something he didn't like, it could be changed. And I, for one, am confident that any changes Brett wanted, Vince McMahon absolutely would go along with, and there'll be no trouble or meddling even considered. After Raw, Brett posted on Facebook how happy he was with how things had gone in his return trip to WWE. He lamented on his showdown with Sean, saying, I can finally say that Sean and I have made peace on what had been a long, draining, and sometimes pointless war of personalities. Brett then furthered the story with Vince McMahon, hinting that he, quote, had friends in high places. It almost felt cathartic for all parties. And the kick to the ghoulies was as mentally shocking as, well, a kick to the ghoulies. Does this mean we're getting a Bret Hart match in 2010? I remember wondering that aloud along with the rest of the IWC. If, if so, like, well, what are they going to do? Not even in a Hulk Hogan sense. Vince McMahon was an elder statesman and Brett had a career ending stroke. It was very limited in his mobility. Oh, if you thought you saw Brett limping, you'd be right, by the way, because his sciatic nerve had been playing up since the flight from Hawaii. The nerve on the side where he had all his knee replaced. So all of that is going on. Brett couldn't take headshots. Brett couldn't bump. His opponent for WrestleMania is Vince McMahon, who even in his prime wasn't the most nimble of in-ring movers. But yet reports were that the Hitman versus the Macman was going to be a feature attraction at WrestleMania 26. We're gonna have to get creative on this one. Before we move on, I want to talk about what happened as Raw went off the air and the reaction from TNA Impact as well. Uh, so Raw ends and Brett gets to his feet, standing, booming ovation from the crowd. He's joined in the ring by the WWE roster with Mark Henry and David Hart Smith raising Brett on their shoulders. It's a wonderful moment that Brett seems genuinely moved by. The combined buzz of Brett Hart's WWE return and Hulk Hogan's TNA debut saw more eyes on wrestling than there has been in a long time. Hulk Hogan is, of course, taking credit for it. You see, if TNA hadn't trotted along down to the bank to pay for the Hulkster, Vince wouldn't have felt so panicked as to pick up the phone to his oldest, most storied rival to run up against TNA Monday Night Impact. Vince McMahon is prone, of course, to a fair shake assault when it comes to peppering pettiness. But in truth, as we know, these conversations with Brett and Vince have gone on far longer than since Hogan was announced on the other channel. Besides, right, both Hart and Hogan had been left in the dust by Maurice and Brie Bella. Not only did their one-on-one -on -one match on Raw draw more eyes than Impact, but it also drew more eyes than the prior Michael's Hart peacemaking segment. The dastardly Vince McMahon addresses the shocking conclusion to Brett's first night back the following week on Raw. Vinnie Mac on the verbal attack saying, Brett screwed Brett in 1997, but last week Vince screwed Brett. And Vince declares that Brett will never be back in WWE. The following week, Vince came out and said that Brett was like chewing gum. And as soon as he lost his flavor, he spat him out. He also compared him to gangrene, saying he had to chop the infected body part off before it spread. The Undertaker interrupts this particular bit of verbal and gives a first-hand appraisal of the Montreal screw job, saying Vince did indeed screw Bret Hart in the most cowardly of fashion. McMahon scurries away and leaves Undertaker to address Shawn Michaels. Maybe they'll have a banger at Mania in a few weeks' time, I don't know. This continues for the next few weeks. Vince McMahon addressing the crowd, lambasting Bret Hart and declaring loud and proud he'll never bring Bret Hart back. It takes John Cena, of all people, to force Vince's arm, saying if he doesn't, it proves that all WWE stars are commodities and McMahon only cares about money. I mean, yeah, but regardless, Vince acquiesces and Bret returns to Raw on February the 1st, introduced to the ring by guest host William Shatner because of reasons. Another remix of his theme here and a rather subdued pop, I think, because of it. Just give him his old music. I don't understand why you can't play the one that everybody knows. I don't get it. Bret was due to be back much sooner than this. He was reported to be part of plans for Raw in Knock 
Knoxville the previous week. But it seems like Creative have made the call to try this newfangled less is more concept for WWE. Brett wastes no time upon his return to calling out Vince McMahon. The two start shooting, brother, brother. Brett calls Vince the best liar there is, was, and will be. He opens up about being in a wheelchair after his stroke and pushing to get better only to get booted in the guts. All the balls. In a callback, Brett says he's a piece of chewing gum, but with just enough flavor to kick Vince's ass right now. Vince rebuts, saying Brett is not a hero. He's got zero personality personality and was carried to greatness by his charismatic opponents. Oh, yikes. Vince talks about Brett's hound dog face, his scraggly hair, and his hobo-like ring attire. The straw that breaks the camel's back isn't the insults about Brett's fashion, but it's when Vince McMahon says that he will never put Stu Hart in the Hall of Fame, because in his eyes, Stu doesn't deserve it. Brett proceeds to boot Vince low, put his jacket over Vince's head, and starts punching him. He goes to put Vince in the sharpshooter and here's Batista to put a stop to that. He does exactly what Bret Hart did to Vince. He pulls Bret's own jacket over his head like some sort of weird schoolboy prank and starts punching him in the general vicinity of his face as Vince watches on. It all looks a bit awkward. McMahon then rears back and spits in Bret's face. A receipt for 1997. The show ends with Bret being held up by Batista as the crowd chant for Cena. Cena did answer of those calls, but only when the cameras went off. It's uh, sort of the rough night for the hitman here. A real odd physical segment as well. If Batista had been in the ring with anyone else, he'd have powerbombed the ever-loving heck out of them. And that's just for starters. You can understand Vince's weird attacks on Brett, but not Batista's option to do the school bully special. Now, this all comes back to not only Brett's uh, already standing injuries uh, with a concussion and a stroke, but the Lloyds of London insurance deal. Lloyds have lawyered up at the sight of Brett getting hoofed in the jewels by Vince. They paid out close to a million due to Brett Hart's forced retirement. So if it turns out Brett is good to go, they're going to be wanting some of that money back. The plans are indeed calling for Brett Hart to return to the ring against Vince. But the way this angle played out, they've got a backup plan should they be unable to placate Lloyds. A tag team compromise that would see Batista and Vince McMahon face John Cena and Bret Hart, which whilst it wouldn't have been a bad showing and it would have placated Lloyds because Bret wouldn't have to do anything, it would have lacked that true spotlight moment for Bret Hart. It didn't come to that, though, as a deal was broached between WWE and Lloyds. They reassured them that Brett was not entering a full-time WWE wrestler agreement, and any matches that he wrestles would be carefully choreographed affairs that WWE, Vince McMahon, Bret Hart, and Lloyds would sign off on before they took place in the ring. So Lloyds didn't want Brett getting powerbombed by Batista. I doubt Brett wanted to get powerbombed by Batista either. But a little, little bit of roughing up through his leather jacket. Yeah, that's that's fine. Tick that off. One week later, and Vince McMahon is called out by John Cena. Cena came to Brett's aid when the cameras went off last week, as we know. He got beaten up by Batista for his trouble. Cena delivers the message that Brett Hart wants one more match. And he wants it at WrestleMania 26 against Vince McMahon. An infuriated McMahon agrees to the match. And as a video package plays of the events from last week, Bret Hart hops into the ring and puts a very brief beating on the chairman, sending him scurrying. Vince runs to the back and announces he's changed his mind about the match. It's not happening now. K, love you, bye. An irate Bret Hart steps off the ramp and in a throwback from that fateful day in Montreal, starts knocking over monitors and obliterating the announce table to dramatic effect. Sadly, one bit of tech he pulls down is a little heavier than he's expecting. He falls over in the process. Oh, Brett, mate. Uh, we've all seen now these Montreal greatest hits played out over an eight-week period. The unexpected ending, the cheap shot, the cries of Brett screwed Brett, the spitting in the face and now the destruction of equipment. All that was missing was Brett writing WCW in the air and then being disrespected by Eric Bischoff for several years. And it would have been like we were in a time 
time machine, you know? Brett's out the following week for Raw. No Vince McMahon, which infuriates Brett no end. He's out there to try again and get the match, and it's not happening. And since it's no longer going to take place, he's going to ride off into the sunset for good. He says thank you and heads off up the ramp to a loud but somewhat confused ovation. Bret Hart apparently done with WWE because he can't have his match with Vince. We go backstage where several WWE stars say goodbye to Bret and he has a final heart to heart with John Cena. As he gets into his limo, a random woman accidentally reverses into the limo, trapping his foot in the door. A freak accident, it seems, and an ambulance is called. What a way to go. A driver accidentally backing into your car. Michael Cole also has the utter audacity to consider this, quote, the worst moment in Bret Hart's life. Oh, yeesh. He was probably given that line to read out, so he gets a pass. One week later, Vince McMahon delivers a message from his office to Bret Hart. All of a sudden, Vince was gung-ho to face him at Mania. He promises it was nothing to do with him, that whole limo incident. Vince says Bret should have a proper farewell next week, complete with wheelchair and hydraulic lift if needed, so he can stand in the ring and say goodbye to the WWE Universe. Brett, his leg in a cast, takes Vince up on the offer, looking worse than ever and angrier than ever when he does so. He and Vince are in the ring together and to the shock of nobody, Vince McMahon says he was behind the stupid car accident last week. He eggs Brett on to face him at WrestleMania 26. He does it by once again verbally emasculating Bret Hart and then kicking his crutch from underneath him. Brett finally agrees agrees to the match at Mania, and Vince is all smug. He's fighting a one-legged hitman at Mania. On March 15th, we get the contract signing, overseen by Raw's guest host for the night, one Stone Cold Steve Austin. Now, Stone Cold Steve Austin has a litany of history with both men, so this is pretty cool. Brett is clearly struggling to get to the ring with his cast on, and Vince finds this utterly hilarious. Before the contract signing gets underway in the center of the ring, Austin announces that Stu Hart will indeed be inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame at WrestleMania. Vince chuffed a bit about this, saying that it means the dysfunctional, derelict Hart family will be ringside for their match. Bret Hart asks for the match to be no holds barred, which he probably should have done before the contracts were printed. Just a thought. Both men sign and agree to it, and Austin seals it with a hell yeah. But there's one more thing to add. Vince McMahon turns around to see that Bret Hart is sat at the table with his cast off. What gives? It turns out it was a setup all along. John Cena knew somebody in the stunt business who pretended to hit Brett's car. Then presumably all the paramedics were actors and they stole an ambulance because they knew Vince would defo agree to the match if he thought Brett was hurt and they made sure it felt like Brett's idea. Yay! Storyline! Vince screwed Vince, says Brett, as he clatters Vince over the table with the cast. Ah. WWE has a tendency with storylines during Vince McMahon's creative control era to either plow through buildings to get to the finish line quicker or take the scenic route. Very rarely is there an in-between. The mere idea of Bret Hart versus Vince McMahon would honestly be enough to get people to buy the pay-per-view. You don't need to do more than that. So this convoluted approach of having Bret emasculated then fake an injury just wasn't everybody's thing. It certainly wasn't mine. The idea of Brett being one step ahead of Vince is good, but I always felt like this was just one of, one of those examples of WWE over-egging the pudding. Not unlike in 2002, where you had Rock versus Hogan. That match is enough. You do a few music videos and you're ready to go. But as Hulk Hogan drove that big rig into the ambulance that Rock was in following a sneak attack by the NWO, I thought they might have overthought this a little bit. And I'm in the same mindset about Brett versus Vince in 2010. You don't need to add any more layers. The story is layered enough. All you've done is just contort the ending somewhat. Not a fan.
One week till Mania and Bret Hart is here on Raw. Walking on both legs, placed perfectly in a pair of denim shorts. He addresses the WWE Universe and repeats most of the things that he said lately. He also says he's ready to swap Bret screwed Bret for Bret beat Vince, which gets a nice chant going. He warns Vince the Hart family will be in full force at WrestleMania and worries what his sisters might do if they see Vince before then. He's going to get his hands on Vince and promises all his fans that Mania next week will be the best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be. Far be it for Brett to get the final word. Vince comes out and says on Sunday, one way or another, you're screwed. Screw job concerns and some health concerns aside, Bret Hart is delighted to be where he is. And for good reason. He told sports writer Alex Marvez that for all the red tape and the hoops needed that needed clearing, he remembers being in a wheelchair after having a stroke with the idea of anything like this being impossible. This entire angle has left Bret feeling lighter, brighter and writer than he has been in at least a decade. I really want to emphasize how incredible a life comeback Bret Hart made from the horrors that he had been dealt over that decade. That is the true strength of a human right there, and it desperately needs pointing out. However, I am here to cast a critical eye over what we're seeing on the screen, but I wanted to make it clear that I think Brett is flipping amazing. After Stu Hart takes his rightful place in the WWE Hall of Fame, it all leads to WrestleMania 26. We're going to dream the impossible dream. Bret Hart versus Vince McMahon. There's a video package set to the song Human by Civil Twilight, a four-piece rock band from Cape Town. There's only one way back to home again, where I feel forgiven, go the lyrics. I am just an image of something so much greater. I am just a picture frame. I am not the painter. Did Vince McMahon choose this song out of interest? <laughs> anyway, out comes Bret Hart in jean shorts and a leather jacket. A really underwhelming entrance. A brief spurt of fireworks once Bret gets into the ring. <laughs> Otherwise, no special ring attire. No ring attire, full stop. Just the same grim gear he's worn for months. Lawler covers it by saying he's not here to wrestle tonight, he's here to fight. In an interview, Brett explained why he opted for the John Cena cosplay instead of the pink and black, saying simply he's not in the same shape he was in his prime, so he didn't want to taint his legacy by even attempting to layer up in the lycra. He wanted that version of Bret Hart to be remembered for great matches. This was a different Bret Hart, and I, I get where he's coming from there. That being said, jean shorts. Vince McMahon is out in his sleeveless number and holding a microphone. Vince stands on the ramp and reveals that Bret Hart deserves a WrestleMania size screwing. To do that, he dug deep into his pockets, hopefully not WWE's pockets, and has bought the entire Hart family as lumberjacks. Bret screwed Bret, Vince screwed Bret, and now Bret's entire family screwed Bret. The gang's all here. Natalia, Tyson Kidd, Davey Boy Smith Jr., Bruce Hart, Diana Hart Smith and the rest. Well, not all of them. Keith Hart, who refused to take part for some reason, isn't here. But most are. They're in tuxedos and evening gowns. They all look lovely. Bruce's Hart is there. He quickly removes his suit jacket to reveal a referee shirt. I bet Bruce Hart was buzzing to be the special guest referee here. Brett takes the microphone in shock at what his family have agreed to do. There's not much I can do about it. But there's one thing I know about the Hart family. You all got paid up front, didn't you? <laughs> Well, it's one thing I learned from the Montreal screw job is there's nothing sweeter than a double cross. <laughs> Brett then revealed he is one step ahead of old Vinny Mac. They got together and plotted. Brett declares this as the night that Brett screwed Vince. The bell sounds and we're off. Brett laying strikes in and stomps as the Hart family cheer him on. The crowd seem into it once the Lumberjacks get involved. They start teeing off on old Vince. Kid and Smith land a sickening double team heart attack to the bloody floor on Vince at one point. Max Bones get rolled back into the ring and Brett gives us a revengeful slow ass beatdown on Vince that the crowd don't really seem that bothered about now. Vince tries to escape under the ring but gets pulled from the 
gathering, clutching a crowbar. And the entire Hart family reels at the sight of a broken down old man holding a crowbar. Brett punches Vince in the guts to get it off him and then uses it against him. Just battering him with it. He even tries stabbing him with it at one point. The crowd were on their hands for quite a lot of this until Brett went for the sharpshooter. They love that big ovation. He then changed his mind and the crowd booed that. Brett wanted to give the crowbar and Vince a little bit more of a meeting. So a few more strikes in, happy days. Done with the crowbar, Smith Jr. then hands Brett a chair. Hitman sits on it for a bit and calls a timeout. Oh, you're a funny man. Brett and the Hearts are the only people having fun at this point. <laughs> that is, until Brett cracks Vince with a steel chair 18 times. Finally, Brett puts on the sharpshooter to a huge ovation and Vince taps out immediately. The whole Hart family get in the ring and celebrate. They finally righted all those wrongs. <laughs> Oh man, this was pretty bad. Uh, the idea was the revenge of Brett Hitman Hart, but it became this weird heart snuff fantasy, something I imagine a few have dreamt of in that family. It was supposed to be the evil owner finally reaping the Survivor Series seeds that he'd sown. But at the end, you kind of had a bit of sympathy for Vince, which is absolutely the wrong side of history. You know when a match hits incorrectly when Dave Meltzer is incapable of giving it a star rating. The Wrestling Observer said many of the Hart family members they spoke to following this found the logic of the story very flawed. Why would the Hart family for even a split second sell out to Vince? If Vince wanted to make sure Brett was done in, he'd just hire every villain on the roster to flank him, not Brett's sometimes nearest and sometimes dearest. Also, the idea that Brett was put in a match in the condition that he was in, legally and physically, seemed ridiculous to most of the family. Brett was very limited going into it, but a litany of other things, including his opponent's age, the overbooking, really dogpiled to make what should have been an iconic WWE return into an interminable fiasco that saw people booing Brett when he refused to finish the match. Not only was this match designed to give Bret Hart the ending he deserved, but it was also planned to be the ending of the Mr. McMahon character. Vince had played him for more than enough time by this point, so what better way to end it than with Bret Hart, the guy with whom the character was effectively born in 1997. Now, we all know that Vince McMahon, let alone Mr. McMahon, is allergic to retirement, so we'll see how that goes. We spin from WrestleMania 24 hours ahead. It's the Raw after. It's a show dedicated to Shawn Michaels, who came up short in his career versus streak banger against The Undertaker. So tonight, WWE is paying homage to the heartbreak kid who is saying goodbye. That includes Brett the Hitman Hart, who headed to the ring in the first hour and congratulated Shawn Michaels on an epic storybook career, calling Shawn one of the very best of all time. Brett wasn't here to praise old heartbreak, though. He was do, there to do far more. He was there to lament on the previous night's shenanigans with Vince McMahon. He heaped praise on his own family. We got an Owen chant and he said farewell to the WWE universe. And that's the end of Brett. No, it's not. Here comes the unified tag champions, Show Miz, The Miz and The Big Show, with a mashup theme only slightly better than the Jared Show one. Miz calls Bret Hart a thief for stealing TV time from him. Him, The Miz, both the unified tag and US champ. Miz calls the entire Hart family the most overrated there ever is, was and ever will be. Before this can get ugly, Bret gets back up from the Hart dynasty, which leads to a spontaneous showdown for the double, double, double division gold. A match that Tyson Kidd and David Hart Smith win by count out when the champs clear off. Brett makes a surprise return two weeks later when Raw emanates from London, a show hosted by European icon David Hasselhoff. You know him, the one that brought the Berlin Wall down during Baywatch. That's the guy. Brett interrupts a show Miz show off to size up the tag champs. He brings out the Hart dynasty, referencing how David Hart Smith's dad got effed and faced him here in this country in 1992. Didn't mention the first part. I was making that up. This leads to a singles match between The Miz and David Hart Smith. Dynasty gets a title shot if Davey Ladd wins, and Brett will declare Show Miz the greatest tag team of all time if Davey Ladd loses. It was nice to see Bulldog's son getting a run out in a singles match. He's genuinely rather good, even at this young age. It is a one-on-one -on -one for David Hart Smith in London, so of course 
he lets his family down and loses via Big Show interference a bit. A pin is put in Brett's novelty size Wayne Gretzky wall planner to put over Showmiz next week on Raw. But for now, he's got to get on a flight to Europe. Brett's drawing power in Europe has never waned. He's off with the Raw roster on the WrestleMania Revenge Tour. He plays guest enforcer in the main event between John Cena and Sheamus in Glasgow and again in Dublin. Everybody gets what they want on both nights. When the ref goes down, Brett gets involved, ends up counting the three for Cena. The fans go home happy. Time to get back to the land of the free and the home of the brave to tell Miz and show how great they are, except nature has other plans. This is indeed the year of the Icelandic volcanic eruption that kept Bret Hart and the entire Raw roster from getting to Raw. It was that episode where Triple H and the Smackdown lot took over as they couldn't get off the continent. Bret screwed again. I know, right? They fixed it a week later though. Bret Hart did come out the following week and declare Show Miz, as promised, the greatest tag team of all time. He also declared in the same breath that the Mountie was the best IC champ and that David Arquette was the best world champ. And also The Miz is a horse-faced idiot. Oh, Brett, you cad. This leads to the Hart Dynasty getting their rematch for the unified tag team titles there and then. Brett is braced for tomfoolery this time. He stops The Miz getting a pin with his feet on the ropes, which ultimately leads to Miz tapping out to Tyson Kidd's sharpshooter, crowning new doubles champs in Double Double E. Brett blesses the titles by kissing each of them. There's a lot of belts. He was there all night. He apparently took two of them out for dinner afterwards as well. Uh, the Hitman finally, finally has closure. He defeated Vince McMahon and helped secure gold for his family. Now, Bret Hart can rest his head and watch the sunrise on a grateful WWE universe. And he did. For about a week, Miz threw down the challenge to face Bret Hart on the Raw the following week from Toronto, Canada. On Facebook, Bret said he found out about the challenge through his son Blade, who was watching Raw when the Miz threw down the challenge. He claims it was legitimately a shock to him, but he was up for it regardless. It was also around this time that Bret officially became a granddad, so maybe he'd be able to get a free bus trip to Raw next week as well. So Bret opens said Raw from Toronto. You know, the one guest hosted by Buzz Aldrin from Off of Space that time. He said whilst he originally accepted the challenge and was ready to go, cooler heads have since prevailed and by the time he got to the arena he decided he didn't want to have the match. So he came out to say I don't want to fight Miz now. <laughs> Fellow Canadian Chris Jericho joined Brett in the ring to run down what the hitman had become, calling him a hypocrite, as was the style of the time. And even saying Brett deserved to get screwed in Montreal because heaven forbid we forget about Montreal. Hart calls Jericho a phony who used to hang around the Hart dungeon and took a U-turn on his decision, agreeing I will face The Miz in a no DQ match tonight after all. The match is on. It's The Miz versus Bret Hart for the WWE United States Championship. An opportunity to rinse the bad taste out of our mouths after the overcooked, overlooked and overbooked match that Vince and Bret had at WrestleMania. <laughs> Bret Hart comes out after The Miz in street fight gear once again and the bell sounds. Miz takes a powder immediately gets on a microphone and reveals that he's got the Hart Dynasty neutralized. He brings out Vladimir Kozlov and William Regal to watch for interruptions from Tyson Kidd and David Hart Smith. Interruptions that happen immediately as the Hart boys jump through the crowd straight in front of Regal and Kozlov and start fighting. This is all part of the plan because Chris Jericho at this point slithers into the ring, takes off his jacket and he and Miz corner Brett. Brett's not alone. Natalia stands by his side ready to fight and she slaps the taste out of Jericho's mouth though. It's all a bit too much as Brett gets punched in the guts before Jericho gets neutralized by David Hart Smith. We're back to Miz and Brett with Hart buckled from the gut punch. Miz goes to lock in the sharpshooter of all things but the Hart dynasty returned to take down Miz with a heart attack instead. Brett locks in the sharpshooter and Miz immediately taps. Just like that we have a new WWE United 
United States champion. An unintentionally hilarious moment sees Brett go to ascend the rope with his belt, but he slips. So he just kind of lifts his legs and pulls himself up as the Hart Dynasty surrounds him. A cherry on top for the hitman was that one of his all-time favorites, Sweet Daddy Seeky, had come to the show to support him, which is a lovely moment. Uh, a non-match that sees Bret Hart win the US title in Toronto. It's a feel-good moment for Bret Hart fans and Canadians all around, but it's a terrible bit of booking for the United States Championship. <laughs> a week later, Raw opens with Batista in a wheelchair, nursing a bunch of injuries from his I Quit match against John Cena. His rant is interrupted by Justin Roberts, announcing the introduction of the new general manager of Monday Night Raw, Bret the Hitman Hart! Brett comes out. He's the GM now. His first order of business is to introduce us to a new WWE pay-per-view called Fatal 4-Way. So it's Brett's fault that happened. He immediately books a wheelchair-bound Batista to face Randy Orton. Batista forfeits the match and declares that he quits the industry altogether. So it's not only that weird Fatal 4-Way concept we can thank Brett for, but also Batista's glittering Hollywood career. Conveniently, Brett becoming general manager means he has to abdicate the United States Championship, which means he won't have to defend it. I don't know whether I'm delighted or annoyed. Miz faces our truth that night to determine a new champ, and Truth wins. Not much fanfare, but it's his first single title in WWE, and over a decade before he'd win 243 more belts as 24-7 champion's most successful person ever. So there's a new sheriff in town, and it's not Luther Root. It's a lonesome dove reference. That's wasted on you. Apparently, there was another candidate for the role of GM on the creative table in WWE CW personality, Abraham Washington. Yeah, the guy who hosted the talk show that gave us the laughing Tony Atlas. Brett picked Washington to Raw's Oval Office by name value alone. Basically, Abraham would have flourished in the GM position, but Brett carried a lot more name value. But why would Vince McMahon, the WWE chairman, sign off on the man who embarrassed him at WrestleMania becoming GM? The answer is, there's no answer. They didn't try and explain it, it just happened. Why let reason get in the way of a crowd pop? It's the sort of booking that became a Vince McMahon trademark during the last decade. No focus on the big picture, just making moments regardless of the logic bubbles it bursts along the way. Brett's first act as GM is to sign a hot new team, the ones who jumped the Hart dynasty last week, Tamina Snooker and twin brothers, the Oozles. What? What's their name? How do you not remember the Oozles? It's what Bret Hart says. The Oozles. Jimmy and Jay Oozle. Who else could he mean? Brett tells David Hart Smith, Tyson Kidd, and Natalia they could do with a bit of adversity. So he's not going to punish the Oozles for sneak attacking them last week. There will be no nepotism in Bret Hart's office. Good luck with the Oozles, gang. That's very oozily of you. Credit to Bret Hart, by the way. Now he's GM, he's sorted his look out. He's now wearing a button-up shirt and jeans. I presume the jean shorts are in the wash. On May 31st, as Bret is getting his feet metaphorically under the table as GM, Vince McMahon makes a shock return, all smiles, reminiscing on the ass kicking he got at WrestleMania. Vince offers tips to Brett as GM, saying that he has to treat the audience like children, which is a little bit like art imitating life. McMahon wishes Brett luck and hopes his story has a happy ending, insinuating that Brett's story won't have a happy ending. The following Monday is a viewer's choice Raw and SmackDown Super Show, a bit like Taboo Tuesday but on a Monday. This night, June the 7th, isn't remembered for the crowd booking Edge versus Randy Orton with Edge's arm tied behind his back, nor is it for an A-team segment that features Dusty Rhodes and mean Gene Oakland. Now tonight, with Bret Hart in control, the contestants from Tuesday night's WWE game show NXT all band together led by show winner Wade Barrett to destroy the ring and beat the crap out of everybody around it. The Nexus are here with an impactful debut and it was on Brett's watch. 
But don't worry, Hitman's gonna sort it out. He addresses the Nexus the following week. The new boys try and get contracts, title matches, and first class travel. Brett hears their demands and shuts them down, telling them to leave of their own volition or be removed by the police. So it's fine for the oozles to jump, attack people to get a gig, but not the Nexus. <laughs> John Cena, however, doesn't want them gone. He wants them to come out to the ring and fight, which they do. And a big old locker room versus interloper scrap breaks out, to which the NXT lot beat a hasty retreat just before the main event. A tag match between John Cena and Randy Orton versus Sheamus and Edge. Bret Hart instructs the entire WWE locker room to stand on the ramp and protect the quartet who will headline the fatal four-way pay-per-view. However, this would be exactly what the Nexus lads wanted. With the roster in the arena, they trash the backstage area and they attack the hitman. David Otunga rips Brett's button-up shirt, the monster. He's only got one before they throw him into the back of a limo and crash it into several parked cars. Brett is pulled from the wreckage looking battered and is told by Nexus they want contracts by Sunday. The following week, Vince opens opens Raw, declaring the ugly scenes at the end of the last show, Bret Hart's fault. Vince says Bret no-showing the pay-per-view on Sunday due to his injuries and the chaos that he caused leaves him with no option but to relieve him of his duties. And just like that, the Bret Hart general manager era comes to an end. He would be replaced by a laptop. Yep, Bret's departure led to the arrival of the Raw anonymous general manager, the most frustrating use of modern technology since the music video for Dilemma, in which Kelly Rowland got a text message from Nelly on Microsoft Excel. Brett's term in the big chair of Raw was an odd and often forgotten one. Started out of nowhere and for no real reason, and he got overshadowed by the NXT invasion, one of the most intriguing WWE storylines in many years. In the few segments that Brett featured in, he didn't seem truly comfortable to be in the driving seat of Raw. Now, he had previously said in interviews that an authority figure role wasn't something he really vibed with, but he was keen to be a team player and went along with it the best he could. Like the limo he was in the back of, Brett's raw GM reign did stop rather abruptly, which may not have been the initial plan. The Wrestling Observer newsletter at the time said that Raw was subject to a frantic last minute rewrite because Brett and the WWE had very suddenly parted ways. The reason isn't clear. It could possibly be due to Lloyds of London getting skittish about the physicality in last week's vehicular violence. It could be because Brett was getting married that summer to third wife Stephanie Washington, no relation to Abraham, and maybe needed some time to, I don't know, sample some wedding shoes and try on some wedding cake. Another possible reason, this has been somewhat rebuked is an impending lawsuit from Martha Hart toward the WWE. Owen Hart's widow wanted unreceived royalties from DVD sales and WWE banned from using Owen's likeness on screen ever again. Was there a conflict of interest maybe with Brett working for the company that his sister-in-law was suing? Brett addressed this online, stating that Owen's wrestling history being scrubbed wasn't in the best interest of Owen. Owen was proud to be a wrestler. Quote, I personally believe Martha Hart has done nothing to keep his memory alive, and sadly, he fades from view a little more every year. I do suspect this lawsuit is more about publicity, ego, and small-mindedness than it is about pro wrestling and all of those that are in it. Brett made his position very clear, stating that Owen was not only proud of his wrestling legacy, but would have been proud to have been part of the WWE locker room today, which Brett was glowing about in his post. As Vince predicted, Brett's story did not have a happy ending. He found himself overwhelmed by the changing tide of the wrestling business and consequently was unable to control this new, new generation in the Nexus. Still, at least he can now ride off into the sunset and rest his head 
Watch the sun rise over a grateful universe. Except he doesn't. Spin on July 19th. The Nexus must be stopped. So John Cena puts together a task force to compete in a seven on seven match at SummerSlam. Cena picks himself of R Truth, the great Carly, Edge. Chris Jericho and Brett the Hitman Hart. A whopper of an ovation for Brett, looking fresh and healthy. Brett's gonna wrestle at SummerSlam. It's gone so well so far, why not? Don't worry, we don't have to wait until the biggest party of the summer to see the Hitman getting those gut punches again. As the volatile WWE team falls apart on the road to SummerSlam, per orders of the anonymous general manager, Chris Jericho teams with Edge to face John Cena and Bret Hart in a Nexus Lumberjack match. Bret opens Raw that night, fashion check by the way, jean shorts, leather jacket, Batman t-shirt, strong look. Bret says he's been training like a lunatic tick for SummerSlam, which I presume means running through the village covered in butter and screaming. He's been disappointed with how the WWE team has fallen apart like cracker bread. He invites Jericho and Edge, who have removed themselves from the team, to sort things out. They tease reaching an agreement. Edge says he's idolized Brett throughout his childhood and throughout his adult life, and for that reason he's back in the team. But it was subterfuge. Edge goes to boot Brett, but Brett grabs his foot and seems intent on turning it into a sharp shooter, but Jericho pops Brett in the face, staggering him and giving Edge and himself a chance to scurry away. Natalia bombs down to the ring looking very upset and pleading with Brett for help. We cut backstage and see why. Those darn naughty Nexus lads are beating the bejesus out of Tyson Kidd and David Hart Smith. Brett calmly waits until the beating is over, until suddenly sprinting up the ramp to their aid. It's been a tough night for Team WWE. Great Carly even gets a kick in. He's out of action. It's just going to be Brett and John Cena at this rate, which is hilarious. Miz valiantly offers his services as Hitman and Cena walk to the ring for the main event. Both guys realize that at this point, yeah, we'll probably need you at SummerSlam. This was nice. It shows the desperation of the team. And also, they kind of put over Miz. On to the main event. The Nexus are the Lumberjacks for a tag match between Chris Jericho and Edge versus John Cena and Bret Hart. And oh, oh, Bret's in the same clothes he arrived in. That's great. Every time Bret has wrestled in 2010, they've been able to use the Street Fight ruse. This is a standard-ish tag match, so maybe maybe at least maybe at least different colored jean shorts this time it's not actually dissimilar all jokes aside to the story that wcw wove with rick flair in 2000 when he was and it was the new blood versus the millionaires club so aggressive were the young lads that flair stopped wearing his ring gear and just battled in his smart casuals i guess this is what brett's doing he takes his leather jacket and sunglasses off at least the batman t-shirt is still a little odd though he just looks like a divorced dad's jumped the back barricade. <laughs> Bell sounds. It's Edge and Jericho versus the Jean Shorts Mafia. Match underway. John is doing the legwork. Brett pops Edge from the ring apron at one point. Otherwise, as expected, big match. John is doing the heavy lifting. Nexus beat Edge and Jericho up after a spell and prepare to attack John Cena and Brett. <laughs> Team WWE then hits the ring to even the odds, with Jericho and Edge eventually doing the right thing and joining Team WWE to beat up the Nexus to a thunderous ovation. A cracking brawl ensues between all sides and the Nexus scurry off. Team WWE are united. They will never be divided. Brett even gets physical here, landing some strikes on Heath Slater. Oh, baby. So the story goes, according to numerous reports, that the spot the Hitman filled was meant to go to Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. Ricky had been one of the first victims of these developmental demons. And having wowed the wrestling world with his comeback matches at WrestleMania, and at Backlash would have been the ideal revenge-seeking candidate. However, Ricky suffered a brain aneurysm after the angle, which brought this incredible comeback story to a very sudden halt. And it opened the door for Bret Hart to get back in there. Plus, the concerns about Brett's well-being were alleviated as he'd be one of 14 competitors in this match, meaning his role would be minimal outside of a big entrance pop and hitting some key crowd-pleasing moves. And so, we come to SummerSlam. A lot has been said about how this match went down and how it should 
have gone down. We're not here to get into the weeds on the creative kerfuffle at the top of that card. Uh, suffice to say, Nexus should have won. We're here to see what our boy gets up to in this, his fourth match in 2010 on TV. The seven on seven elimination match, which features the baby face turn of young and hungry former nxt -er Daniel Bryan. Forget him. There's Bret Hart wearing some new Bret Hart merch and his trademark jean shorts. Why isn't this a custom ring attire in a WWE game? I'm, I'm just saying. It's about 15 minutes and two eliminations into the match that Bret Hart finally reaches for the tag. He unloads on Heath Slater with strikes as Michael Cole calls this arguably the greatest moment of his WWE career. <laughs> the hottest place on planet Earth that day was Michael Cole's cheeks glowing with embarrassment off that last statement. Bret lands a scoop slam and Commentary are mind blown by this. We get an inverted atomic drop and a clothesline. He's doing moves. Well, our guy. He locks in the sharpshooter, but Heath tags out whilst in the hold to skip Sheffield. As this happens, Wade Barrett throws a steel chair into the ring. The ref informs Brett that Heath is no longer legal. Brett forgets that this isn't an ODQ match. He grabs the chair, clatters Skip across his right back with a chair, and the ref disqualifies Brett Hard. Brett's done. Off to the showers with your lad. It was brief, right? But of all the performances we've had from Brett Hart since his comeback, this was my favorite. Like, it looked more like the Brett of old than I have seen all year. Even the DQ makes him look like a bit of a badass in the process. Nicely done. The Nexus went on to suffer defeat at the hands of Team WWE. Don't ask me why. And Nexus were forced to compete in singles matches the next night on Raw. We got a wholesome moment on Raw involving our boy Brett. He, alongside the cast of Going the Distance, the thing that Charlie Day did that isn't always sunny in Philadelphia, presented the Hart Dynasty with brand new tag team titles that replaced the four straps they've been carrying around for ages. Yes, we can not only thank Brett for the Fatal 4-Way pay-per-view and Batista leaving for Hollywood, we can also thank him for those weird gladiator dirty pennies that were the tag team titles. The Wrestling Observer reports that these dirty penny belts were notoriously disliked backstage when they were presented a year ago. Despite that, they were debuted anyway and they got panned all over again by the industry and the fans. So much so that the belts that Brett gave the Hard Dynasty were changed a short while later for something slightly better. Only slightly. Justin Gabriel was set for the opportunity of a lifetime on this Raw. He was going to face Brett Hart. That was until the anonymous Raw general manager piped up, declaring they hate Brett Hart and Brett will never wrestle on Raw again. And instead, Justin Gabriel faced Randy Orton. This didn't stop Brett Hart from turning up. Two weeks later, to open the 900th episode of Raw, though, Brett on the show puts over the success of Monday Night Raw, saying it now has the most shows in primetime television. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Coronation Street's crying. Brett wants to bring The Undertaker out as the only other lad from that first Raw who's still around. But this brings out Kane instead, who beat Taker into a vegetative state recently. Remember that? Undertaker got attacked and Kane started an investigation to find out who did it but it turned out it was him. Ha <laughs> ha! Banter. Kane plans to take out an icon and goes to chokeslam Brett. Hart Dynasty keep him at bay until The Undertaker bongs his way into the ring, sending him packing. The Raw Anonymous General Manager then announces that the main event of Raw tonight, going against what he said just two weeks ago, will be Bret Hart versus The Undertaker. <laughs> what? The Anonymous GM didn't just go back on his promise to never have Bret fight on Raw again, but went back on the announcement that it would main event. The match took place about half an hour later. Taker stands across from Bret Hart, now wearing a black sleeveless number, and yes, jean shorts. But Wade Barrett rocks up to say the match isn't happening. Barrett says he will prove The Undertaker is a dead man, and then he will de-louse Bret Hart. <laughs> harsh. Wade gets into the ring. He's immediately drummed by The Undertaker. Lights go out with a bong. When they come back on, Brett's gone. He's been replaced by Kane. We see Undertaker and Kane brawl for a bit. Kane teleports away. The Nexus turn up. We've not a Scooby-Doo where Bret Hart went. Maybe he went to the Canadian version of hell where everybody is impolite and all the poutine is undercooked. 
Brett wouldn't feature on WWE TV for the remainder of the year, so there is some weight to my theory. But he wasn't quite out of sight. THQ released SmackDown vs. Raw 2011 that featured a Hitman edition, complete with Bret Hart on the cover and in the game. Didn't recognize him wearing ring attire, I must say. They should have put a jean shorts option in, just for a laugh, I'm just saying. Also in September, a Bret Hart tribute would be held during a live event in Madison Square Garden. Bret was presented with framed photos of his family and a New York Rangers jersey, which had number 10 on it to symbolize WrestleMania 10. The event held in the hallowed halls of MSG, where Bret and Owen tangled before Bret won the title from Yokozuna. When the Nexus tried to crash the party, the Hart Dynasty made the save, and we got an impromptu six-man overseen by Jerry the King Lawler, one of Bret's oldest rivals. It ended with Heath Slater tapping to the sharpshooter and the crowd going crazy. It was lovely, but not on telly. Bret would be part of the Raw in Calgary, the Monday before bragging rights. We didn't see him on TV then either. Throughout the night, there are We Want Brett chants. WWE have a video package that features Brett's music. They keep playing it almost to wind the crowd up. Brett turns up when the cameras are off after Raw to be the special guest referee in a match between John Cena, Sheamus, Wade Barrett, and WWE champion Randy Orton. Orton won the match, and then he, Cena, and Hart repelled a Nexus invasion with Brett sending Canada home happy by whacking on a sharpshooter on old Heath Slater once more. Strange decision to not involve Brett on the TV product, but sensible to use him in Canada. The closest we got to a Brett sighting around this time was Michelle McCool dressed as Brett Hart to inflame the ire of Natalia on an episode of SmackDown. Brett was on WWE's European tour after this. Somewhere, as we've said, he was forever a draw. He teamed with the Hart Dynasty to beat the Nexus in six-man tag action across Germany. The matches didn't tack the hitman too much. He'd wait for the hot tag, pick the win up for the hearts, usually with a sharpshooter to Heath Slater. Everyone's happy. In November, Bret Hart's WWE contract expired, drawing a line under Bret the Hitman Hart's bizarre return to the company in 2010. In the years that followed, Bret would make the occasional trip to WWE land. He got Michael Cole to kiss Jerry Lawler's foot at Over the Limit 2011. He even broke the promise of the anonymous Raw general manager and wrestled on Raw again the following September in Canada, once again teaming with John Cena to defeat Alberto Del Rio and Ricardo Rodriguez, tapping out Double R in the Double S. He popped up on the 1000th episode of Raw in 2012 and was honoured with a Bret Hart Appreciation Night dark segment on Raw in 2013. He served as Natalia's manager in a generational battle on NXT against Charlotte Flair with Daddy Rick in her corner. He re-entered the Hall of Fame in 2019 when the Hart Foundation tag team got inducted. This was the infamous speech that was interrupted by now world-renowned piece of garbage, Zach Madsen, who jumped the crowd and took Hart down. For his trouble, he got his head kicked in by the revival. The last time Brett was seen on WWE TV to date was in the crowd at Clash at the Castle in Cardiff. The Europeans will forever love Brett, and a pop for the hitman was almost as loud as the one that Tyson Fury got when he clattered Austin Theory. Between WWE appearances, Brett appeared on a video for Impact Wrestling, congratulating Ken Shan Rock on its Hall of Fame induction and was even on hand in AEW at the Double or Nothing pay-per-view, the night they crowned their first champion. Every time the hitman has made his presence known, he's been met with love and affection, and he rightly deserves it. So in terms of how this 2010 run plays out in his legacy, it truly doesn't change anything. I mean, true, Brett's performances were not the hitman we knew, not anywhere near except SummerSlam. Hart would often get lost in the noise around this particular era as well. The over-egging of said puddings made for tough viewing, but it doesn't dull the legacy of Bret Hart. For many, it was their introduction to Bret Hart, but his body of work is so powerful before this that even those who first witnessed the jean shorts era knew how important Bret was to wrestling. If anything, this breakdown of Brett's year is an indictment on the booking rather than the man. Vince McMahon's creative genius had dulled somewhat by this point, and in a changing media landscape, it was all about giving us big moments immediately rather than patiently building them, leaving gaps in continuity that you could lose a bus down, and questions on motive that not even Columbo could get his head around. A Bret Hart return under a different booking sheet may have felt very different indeed, but this is the one we got.
Less slow builds to magnificent moments, more fake casts than car crashes. Bret Hart's 2010 was disastrous on many optics, but it doesn't change the fact that he is still very much the best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be. Stay safe. Love you, bye.